Hey everybody, um, so my name's Clint and I'm here to do a presentation on making a living from your art, uh, a new take on the streaming era. C-dubs my music name, there we go down there. Anyways, who am I, right? Who am I? I'm not, okay, I'm not a famous artist, nor I'm a producer, nor I'm an AR guy, right? But I've been in the music creation side of the industry for about 30 plus years. Um, in 2016, I started using a subscription to Apple Music. Um, then, as a music fan, I kind of fell off the mainstream of the music industry. Um, what I found during that first year was a quiet revolution in the industry. I then started to research the music subscription era for artists. Um, generally, the evidence I found shattered many of my preconceptions. The patterns were obvious. Young artists were figuring it out. Six years later, I had collected a series of reality checks for creative artists. They are not profound, new, or revolutionary, just insights on how young artists are making it work in the streaming era. But what started all this? Okay, so what started this was me falling off the mainstream. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm going to go back to the Billboard 100 from 1975. It's going to date me a bit, but I lived during what I call the golden era. And at that point in time, if you were an artist or a band or anything, you had to go through the mainstream. You had to have a record contract and that record contract got you into the studio. It got that music tracked. It got it mastered. It got it duplicated. And then all the levers that the mainstream of the industry is so good at pulling radio concerts, the whole thing. This is what created this era. It was a boom, right? And it boomed all the way to 1999 where it peaked in CD sales. And so, but that hot 100, when I look at that in 1975, the mainstream represented basically all the best music of that era. You fast forward to now and go to the Billboard Artist 100 and it really is only what the mainstream is kind of making. And what doesn't appear on the Billboard Art 100 is the stuff that I was finding when I fell off the mainstream. So what do I mean by that? Well, when I first got Apple Music, I'm sitting at the top like everybody would. And I'm hitting here. What about they want me to listen to? Who's the artist they're pushing? And it was really stuff that I was kind of going, okay, some of it's fantastic. Look, the mainstream's still amazing. The big three labels have giants working for them. They have giant artists and there's always going to be great music from the mainstream. But I was kind of like, no, oh, it's all kind of like pushing at me. And it was the push. Same thing on Spotify. Then I fell off, meaning I stopped looking at what they wanted me to listen to and I started digging in on my own. And this is called a lean in listener. It's what Spotify calls a lean in listener as opposed to a lean back listener, which most people are. And then I started pecking and curating and looking and finding. And every time I went and looked, I just kept finding these artists. And I'm like, who's that? I think the first guy I found was Rag and Bow Man singing I'm Human. Now he bubbled up, but this was before he broke. And I just kept finding artists and it kind of blew me away. I didn't know what to think. It says, who are all these artists and why don't I hear about them on the top tiles? And then I kind of realized something was going on, right? And then all my friends were saying, well, there's no good new music. And I'm like, well, I just spent three weeks and I've got 60 tracks and they're all phenomenal. And none of you have heard of them. I've never heard of them. What's going on? So this is when I fell off the mainstream and I started curating music. And then really this got me kind of going, it's got to end. It never ended. There wasn't a week that went by that I didn't find some amazing artists doing some very innovative stuff. This led me to conclude the mainstream no longer owns all the best music. Off the mainstream was where I was finding a lot of innovation. Who knew? Okay, so the reality check. So as I was doing this, and as I'm looking at it, I'm starting to kind of like, well, how are people making money? Because somebody also said, well, there might be good new music you're finding off the mainstream, but none of them are making any money. Yeah, that's what I thought too. Nobody's making any money. So I started kind of looking at this and pulling it apart. And I realized that in the streaming era, it was vastly different than the CD or LP when you're selling stuff. And most of my contemporaries were talking about the streaming being a ripoff and trying to equate it to CD sales. And then I realized as I was watching and observing these young artists, make their living in the streaming era, that it's no longer about selling anything. So what do I mean by this? So it's about engaging a fan base. This is all about it is. And I'm going to start talking about selling something versus engagement. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to this chart, which is phenomenally cool because it kind of goes from 1973 all of a sudden to 2021. And this is U.S. recorded music sales. And this is from a company called um, RIAA, and I'm, I get all this stuff, and they allow me to use this stuff. And this shows unit sales. So these are music sales by volume, by format. And you can see where everything kind of, you know, you know, everything's going up. You got the eight track cassette, mini cassette. And then of course, now you've got download and single downloads. You get into 2013 and it's the peak of the download era. And then you get into 
kind of like 1999, and it's the peak of the CD era and all this stuff. So these are just pure units. And then, of course, the singles, the 99 cent download is massive, but it didn't get interesting until I started adding in where the revenue is coming from. And this is where everything changed because as you can see from 2005, and then you got the 2006, 2008, Spotify comes out, music subscription becomes a reality. And then all of a sudden the revenue picture completely changes. Nobody's buying things anymore. People are signing up for subscriptions. And this was this thing that was like, okay, this is pretty obvious that everything is now subscription and the artists weren't trying to sell anything. They were simply trying to build a fan base and engage with them. Okay, 1999, think about it. 1.5 billion units sold and 14.6 billion in revenue. This was the peak of the CD era of selling units where the industry was making the most money in the history of the recording industry. 14.6 billion revenue in the US. I can't remember what it was worldwide, but I got US numbers from that website, so I'm using those. You fast forward to 2021, and now you're down to 334 million units, okay. 15 billion in revenue in the USA. It's approximately 25.9 billion worldwide. And 2022 is going to be bigger than this. And 57.2% of 2021 was paid subscription. So things were changing um, and it was changing pretty quick. And how artists were engaging this change was interesting. Okay, misconception number one, Spotify is the problem. Royalty reform is still very needed. I'm never not going to say this, and I'm actually a reformist, and I actually try to dig in, and it's a very complex issue, and I'm extremely interested in it, and I think I know or have a good idea of what should be changed, what could be changed. But when I talk to people, and they're comparing unit sales to their Spotify streams, I know immediately that that was my preconception, and it's not how it works. Spotify is only 30% of the potential market. So that's like comparing your CD sales from 1975 or your LP or 85 or whatever to one record store chain. It doesn't work this way. Spotify is only 30% of the streaming market. Also, Spotify is one part radio, the free version. It's one part metrics, and it's one part recurring revenue. So Spotify has a lot more value than just the record store or just the digital service provider. It is a retail store or DSP, as I just said. They built it. They should make money. Yes, royalty form is still very needed, but I'm not sure it's just the Spotify stream payout is what you've done. This is what I was realizing. So Spotify has value. They're a retail store. They're not the owners of everything, and it's not where the reform needs to be. It's like saying Sam the Record Man or Tower Records, you can't make any money when you have all this inventory. So it's a misconception. More of this will be revealed. Okay. This is the fan pie if you're a new artist. Think about it. 1.6 billion streaming users, over 530 million subscribers, people that are paying, what I call tithing the 10, which I encourage all my friends to do. Um, believe me, it's like, oh, I can't afford Spotify. It's like, so let me get this right. You can afford $10 coffees a day, but you can't afford $120 a year to access to all the music in the world. Who knew? Okay. So this is really breaks the pie out. And this is from one quarter in Q2 of 2021. Spotify owns about 30%. Some of this stuff is not absolutely accurate because Apple doesn't disclose all the time, neither does Amazon, but it's so close, it's good enough for us to understand the streaming pie, right? So 15% for Apple, 13% for, for Amazon Music. And Tencent Music, China's big grower, right? Got to be aware, et cetera, et cetera. So this not selling anything anymore this is the pie that you have to find and extract fans from this is what you must concentrate and when i started observing the patterns and the tactics of all these young artists they know this explicitly okay so the simple fan funnel that i noticed was it wasn't about selling anything it was about growing a fan base and they did it by releasing music a lot um, very prolifically and building on their catalog slowly but surely creating awareness a rain, awareness turns into plays hopefully they play their music they save it that person becomes a new fan they dig in some more because you keep engaging with them and they become a super fan and then they start sharing with their friends this generally happens from people between the age of 15 and 25. Get north of 35 and the behavior changes. We're not going to get into that in this session, although I'd love to. It's called music paralysis for another time. Okay, engagement funnels and what I mean by this is that everybody I know was saying Spotify, Spotify, Spotify. And it's like, I'm kind of going, well, Spotify is only 30%. So it's really, if you're trying to promote yourself solely through 
Spotify, you're missing 70% of the picture. So what I notice is that every single artist, when they're sharing their music, never shares a Spotify link. They share a link tree, right? They go out and they say, here's my music and here's everywhere to get it. And then you start realizing what I call the engagement funnels, all the different places that people are engaging with your music and you don't want to discriminate. You want to offer them an easy way to get to them all. Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, Tidal, Amazon Music. I'm going to buy it. YouTube Music. Deezer or buy it on Bandcamp, iTunes, or Amazon. So this is pretty, pretty much the standard fare when people are sharing music is they share link trees. Um, I share link trees simply to be courteous when I'm sharing music with friends. And I, I use this thing called Song Whip, which is free. It's very cool. There's much better ones. And then when I go to all funnels that lead to your website, I'll talk a bit about websites. The other thing I noticed with great regularity is that all the websites were the same for the most part. Um, these are two quick examples where basically once the f engagement funnels led to the website, it was like, okay, here we are. This is the band. Here's a picture of us usually. Um, you want to buy my hard goods? Tends to be the first things they want to sell since that's the get there. Once they're there, you got there from YouTube or Spotify or somewhere. Do you want to buy a hard CD or an LP or some merch if they sell merch out of the gate? And then nine times out of 10, it was, here's my whole music library, right? Here's where you can, you might've come in on album five, but here's album four, three, two, and one, all in link trees, or this is where I'm going to be in real life. Do you want to be my fan? Sign up here. Do you want to license my music? Sign up here. With great regularity, all the websites were the same. They were this simple, simple formula. And every one of these musicians and every one of these artists always shared stuff in their link tree, right? And you can see with Dirty Heads, it's a much bigger one because it's a pre-release. So there's pre-orders, buy it. They're basically firing on every cylinder possible. We're over here with this wonderful Canadian singer-songwriter couple. There's really the smaller list that most people promote. Pretty cool. Okay, the trick that I've found in this new era, it's not about selling something. The trick is to find fans, grow their ranks, and keep them engaged. Reality check number two, there is just too much new music. There's just too much music. There's just too much music music. I got to edit that. Okay, so too much music. It's not a bad thing. Okay, I mean, there's a lot of music out there, but I'm going to go down through this and kind of say, yeah, how do you get noticed? Well, that's really hard, right? But it's not impossible, as I'm going to explain as we go through this. Um, there's 80 million tracks on Spotify. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. So this doesn't tell you that the industry is different today than it was in 1975. Nothing else will. Up to 60,000 tracks a day are being uploaded. Over 8 million creators are growing on Spotify. This is going to be the same on Apple Music and same on all the other DSPs. Wow. Love lot of music, right? And these music stores that have built these infrastructures, aka Apple Music, Spotify, Amazon Music, Deezer, Tidal, right? Those are the retail stores and they cater to their customers. There you go. They're not the evil people. They're simply the providers of the music. They take their profit. Maybe it should be less. Maybe it should be more. Maybe they should pay more, but they're not the evil giants. They're simply the providers of the music like Tower Records was in the past. Okay. The big labels, own the revenue. Just going to cut it like it is, uh, but not the majority of the new releases. The big three labels own almost all the revenue. And in here, there's some stuff that's going on and things that I can talk about in depth at some other time, but it's absolutely astounding. They make an estimated 2.56 million an hour, the big labels. It's crazy. They're banking on this era like you wouldn't believe with old contracts. It amazes me that old artists aren't redoing their contracts because these contracts were written at a time where CD dupe and, and warehousing and promotion, all these things cost money. And that's why the record labels took the margin. Now they just upload it and take the freaking royalty checks. It's unbelievable. But the big three or the big labels do not own the majority of releases. Indie or what is now called artist owned is the growing category. So let's have a look. 2021-22. It's approximate simply because it bridges some fiscal years, but it's pretty accurate, right? We're talking Sony Music, 9.12 billion, 35% of the market for the most case. Warner Music, 5.7 billion, 22%, right? Universal Music Group, 2.31 billion, 9%. And then the rest, which is independence, um, indie music, other labels and everything, it's about 8.7 billion or 34%. So I could really cut that the other or the rest cut into a little bit more detail, but suffice it to say, it's just not the big three. And when you even look at it like that, the fact that the big three own that much is pretty astounding. Okay, 
Here's another cool thing about this part of the era and then why there's too much new music. And frankly, I grew up in an industry where I'm part of that, right? Because I grew up in that whole music creation software era, tools that became amazing to where now with not a lot of money really and with some really inexpensive gear, you can make a Grammy-worthy album in your bedroom. The gear to create music, software, hardware, right, is amazing and completely accessible. Not only that, you can go learn about it on YouTube or take a course. There's no barrier to A, being able to record the music. You don't need a recording studio. Is a recording studio good? Absolutely. Is a mastering studio good? Absolutely. But the industry's told us too many things have happened where you can make a Grammy Award album in your bedroom. Now, aggregators, TuneCore, DistroKid, CD Baby, and there's about 25 of them and growing, have removed all the barriers to releasing music. Stroke of genius, right? All of a sudden, bang, 24 hours after you want to release an album, if you've got all the elements needed for that album, bang, it's in every streaming digital service provider in the world, and your music's available to somebody to listen to. And this is where I'm also finding that innovation in that free space, I can do whatever I want, release my music. I don't have an A&R guy telling me what to do, how to dress. This is where Innovase is thriving off the mainstream. It's only an observation. Okay, this is why this freedom, this too much music, yes, on one hand, it's massive. What do you do? There's so much music. What are you going to do? How do you even get heard? But what's happening off the mainstream when it's less of a product potentially and more of an expression is authenticity is on the exploding side of things. Authenticity is your brand. I cannot tell you how many times I go off the mainstream and I go, wow, that's whacked out music. That person can't have a following. And then I find out they've got like 20 million monthly Spotify listeners and I'm blown away. So authenticity is your brand. It's part of my one, two punch and slogans, but authenticity is so important in this day and age. And I think this is fantastic from an artistic standpoint. Okay. Reality check number three, rock star money is rare. And a lot of times when people are talking about, you know, making money in the industry, they're thinking rock star money because we grew up with that. You know, Rolling Stones made rock star money. Steppenwolf made rock star money, right? You know, all these guys in the eighties made rock star money. You can still make rock star money. You're billionaires, things and everything. It's rare. It really is still part of the mainstream. They still kind of own these big ticket, these big producing. They get the lion's share of their revenue. And there's some stars out there and some phenomenal artists and they make rock star money, but it's rare. Okay. Okay. Back. Go to a misconception number two. So these are some of the misconceptions I'd like to talk about. You only make money from touring. Little segue. Um, this is true if your catalog's old. I hear this all the time. Oh, you only make money by touring. Says, oh, that's not the case. That's not what I've observed. But it is if you're old and your catalog's old and you got no new music, right? That people are going to listen to on a playlist or stream. And if your fans actually are old enough, they'll pay 300 to 500 to you. Great. Let's go make money doing that. This is not true if you're a new artist, right? In real life is the highest form of engagement. And I've noticed with all these young artists that they want to have zero friction for you to be able to come see them live and they want it to be very affordable. If you live in any city and you look at some of these new acts coming out, right? I am in Toronto and I'm actually seeing some phenomenal acts for 20 to $40 at really good clubs at a venue that I'd much rather see than going to a big stadium. I gravitate towards it. Cannot believe how much value is there. Okay, art money, rough math. So this is just rough math. So as I started going into this and I started really researching these musicians, because somebody said to me, well, none of them are making any money. And I went, okay, that makes sense. Everybody's telling me none of them are making any money. So I said, it should be pretty easy since I'm finding so much good music to find an artist that had a day job. Well, every time I found a pretty good kind of authentic slash artist doing something, right? I do the dig and they're actually making some money. And this is where I came up with the term art money. And um, so Spotify actually gives up some metrics to everybody in the world. Apple doesn't, some of the other services don't, but Spotify does. They give up how many monthly listeners any artist has. Now here, I've actually picked one of these super, super unique artists, right? So would never be on the radio, the mainstream, but never push this guy, right? And his music is all over the map. Phenomenal artist, so authentic. It truly is only him called the Unknown Mortal Orchestra. And if you listen to his music and then realize that he's got 2.1 million monthly Spotify listeners, it'll blow you away, okay? So now I take that number since I know that Spotify is one third of the streaming market and it lets me extrapolate some numbers. They're just for fun, just to get an idea. Is this guy making any money? So now 
I take this and I'm taking this thing as those are monthly listeners. That listener will probably listen to 10 tracks or more of this artist, but I'm going to take the lowest common denominator humanly possible. And I'm simply going to take one monthly Spotify listener doing one track enough to make one streaming royalty. This is really low. And I'm only going to use Spotify payouts, which you probably know are one of the lowest in the industry. Okay, so I take this 2.1 million monthly Spotify listeners. I times that by three. This means this guy has 6.3 million worldwide listeners. 6.3 million, right? Then you take 6.3 million times 0 0.0033, and it equals about 20,000 gross per month. Just rough figures, okay? There's a lot of stuff here. We all know there's details and things get pulled out. But let's say he's an independent artist, 100%. That's his gross revenue. Spotify, Apple Music, the retail stores that give us this music take their 30% profit. We could argue that number, but that's the number they make, right? I think Apple takes a little less now in some cases, and some of the other ones are taking a little bit less, depending on if you're independent or not, etc. But he's making net about 14.5K a month. This is so on the low scale because this is one stream per month for every one of his followers and I'm only using the Spotify payout. When if you really tried adding this up, he's probably making two to three, maybe four times more in streaming revenue with 2.1 million monthly Spotify listeners. But even at this low estimate, he's making 176K per year. Art money. That's art money, okay? It's enough for him to live where he lives because he lives in the middle of nowhere, somewhere in Asia, and he makes music on his terms. Unbelievable. Okay, so let's take it on the opposite spectrum, and we're going to go to the low end of things, okay? And on the low end of things, it's this really cool band that just came out. So this is they're on the two releases. One, this is their second album release. They're from Toronto. It's a seven piece. They're phenomenal. It's completely roots rock. And they've only got 11,000 or 12,000 monthly Spotify listeners. You multiply by this three and you get 35,000, then 36,000 times 0 0.0033. And you get $117 a month gross. Less the 30%, they're making it about $82 a month or about $1,000 a year at the lowest possible thing. So you can see that if you're just starting out and you just have a couple albums up and you haven't built a following, right? They're way better than the following is telling us. And I have a feeling once this album comes and the second album comes and they go grind this album, it will be pretty easy for them to grow their following. But at the beginning, it's a grind. And this is a perfect example of the beginning grind, right? You're, you're fighting for fans. You're fighting for people to be fans to stay with you and fighting for people to listen to your music. They're at the bottom, at the very start, the foyer of this thing I call the grind. But that's it. So that's what a lot of people that release one album and think, I'm not making any money. Well, it takes way more than one album. We're going to talk a bit more about that later. Okay. So how is art money made? And like, again, the biggest misconception was Spotify streams. Well, if you look at my little chart here, it's the sum of all parts. If you're just thinking Spotify streams, well, that's only 30% of one funnel. It's only one funnel, right? Where really, when you start digging into how these artists are making money, they're firing on a bunch of re I call revenue funnels, right? And so streaming's one and it's broken down into a bunch. That all comes into a piece of money that comes in. YouTube video, they're making some money from there depending on how popular they are. We could have another conversation about YouTube and how much I hate them and how much I love them, but the video's good, but it is a necessary evil for artists and that's why they release. And that's probably why you see a lot of bad videos because they just want to, it's lost leader. There's a lot of people that use YouTube and that's just what you got to do and it, it, again it's an engagement funnel trying to drive people to your website uh, social media if you're big enough definitely feature placements if you become a feat right um, licensing big thing right um, in real life yep gigging right you don't make your whole money but with these younger artists they, they don't they, all they want to do is break even on the tour not make it a profit center but they are selling some merch and they're selling tickets and they're now selling vip experiences if you look a lot of the times they're really catering to their super fans and that's where they make some extra money on the live tours they actually give these vip experiences and it costs money again for the super fans that are down at that level they have something for them and then hard good sales this is either on their website, like I showed you with um, the Dirty Heads. Here's my CD, here's my vinyl, or here's my merch, right? Or a lot of artists save merch for live, so it's special, so you can't get it anywhere else but in real life, so that happens. But hard goods sales are still a thing. You're just not doing it at you know, Tower Records and you're making some from Amazon selling some CDs, but really it's a direct revenue thing now, so you're making more margin. The sum of all those parts, right, right, 
basically all of these things make up what art money is, okay? So it's not just one thing, it's the sum of all your revenue funnels or engagement funnels moving in and revenue comes in on a monthly basis. Okay, you'd be surprised how many artists are making some serious art money. And art money for me is anywhere from 79K all the way up to 900K. I perceive when, it, when, it, when an artist, even independent or small label, bridges above a million dollars a year, they've just bubbled into a little bit of a more serious zone. And then at that point in time, things change. Hopefully they stay with a small label, an indie label slash a facilitator label, or they stay fully independent. And there's lots of examples of that. Okay, reality check number four, new music is king. Okay, without it, there is no engagement. Okay, this is one of the drags of the industry and one of the wonderful things of the industry. Um, it's a drag simply because there is such an insatiable requirement for new. There is a massive amount of pressure on artists to always write new music. And when there's that much pressure for an artist to have to write new music, if you're in the business and you write music, you realize that sometimes you can finish a song quick. And a song that's finished quick is two edits from being great when it's just a good song. So one of the fallbacks of this is that I hear a lot of these really, really, really innovative and interesting, authentic artists with the songs just a tad incomplete. Sometimes not, sometimes they are. But nonetheless, even at the mainstream, you talk to Beyonce, she understands this pressure for new, and so does the beginning artist. They understand the pressure for new. Biggest mistake you can make is write one single and think that should make you famous. You're dead, right? It's cumulative work, right? You've got to have a lot of content, right? And it's a dogfight to keep your fans engaged, hence why you have to have new music. Now, you, you do this by trickle releasing. I'll talk a bit about this. You repurpose tracks because writing new music's hard, but doing an acoustic version isn't. Reissuing, another tactic, remixing, and this is one of these things that I came up with. Being prolific is the business. Okay, the Coachella cycle. This is something I made up, right? And I find Coachella to be a very interesting thing because when people tell me that there's no good new music, right, I kind of go, well, uh, the mainstream doesn't have any good music. I go, well, explain the Coachella poster, right? Who are those people? The only mainstream artists are generally the large fonts, and it's one of the hardest gigs in the industry if you're a mainstreamer, right? Harry Styles knows if he goes to Coachella, and this is 2022 coming up next April, right? 2023, 2022? I can't remember. It's one of the ones. But that's a hard gig, right? And Billie Eilish, that's a hard gig when you get the headliner at thing. It's basically that festival is populated by mostly music fanatics or music lovers of a younger age, and they're very discerning. And if you if you're crap, they'll tell you. If you're great, they're great. And they don't care if you're a K-pop band. Blackpink killed it, I heard. Who knew? But anyways, Coachella is a very interesting barometer for me. And um, 57, by the way, um, this is how prolific I hunt music now. I have 57 of those artists in my catalog. It's a real feat for a dude of my ripe age. But I'm actually that prolific and hunting for new music and finding this stuff off the mainstream. And the vast majority of the fonts and the bands and the artists that are on the Coachella poster are off the mainstream. And it was something that that's what they prided themselves on. I think it's a phenomenal festival. But it actually starts kicks off the summer festival circuit. Um, and I ended up calling this yearly cadence is what I call the Coachella cycle, right? So each spring, the majority of artists, this is just the majority, start trick of releasing singles. January, February, you start seeing singles coming out. Singles, 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 singles. And here's my single, here's another single. And it's all leading up to their spring release of their new AP or LP for that year. Now, if they're lucky, most of these artists love it. If you're lucky, you're on the Coachella lineup because it is the granddaddy of festivals that if you can start there, it's fantastic. And then this kicks off the summer festival season. And then in between these artists do their IRL in real life tour and what they do is they they go between the festivals but in between the festivals because they understand their metrics and their analytics that are given to them now they go to smaller towns and they know where their fans are so they might have no fans in Chicago so we're going to do Des Moines instead because Des Moines got more fans we know the fans are there that's where we go right so you in between you go to these things that generally smaller venues they know where their fans are they don't want they want the bar to have that touch point that the highest form of engagement engagement is in real life and at the end of the year when they finish this cycle and that's promoting the album right so they're promoting the whole album that they just released and then they get out of that tour 
and they go back into the writing phase and then they work at the end of the season in the winter and they get into what I call the writing season, then rinse, repeat for the next year. I call this the Coachella cycle simply because it is the granddaddy of festivals that start this whole scene of events that happens almost every year. And I've been measuring it and following it kind of for six years and it's like clockwork. Yes, music gets released all the way through the year, but for the majority, it all comes in the spring and then it's worked through the tours and then people write in the winter. Okay, all boats rise. So uh, I like to talk about this. It's kind of an old thing to a new thing. So if you go pre-subscription era, when we were in the CD selling, CD, LP, whatever, you're going to be selling a hard unit, right? The cycle and the was generally release the album. You'd have about a 90-day window of sales, and then it would fall off and then get to an ebb and flow, right? So that top grid is showing three album releases from a band that got popular, more popular, and really popular. It's all just hypothetical, but this is kind of the arc. You release the album, it sells, it diminishes. Now, now your market's waiting for the new album. Album, and the new album goes up a bit higher because now you've got two albums out and then it sells for 90 days and goes back down. But you'll notice that all the albums after they start selling in this pre-subscription CD era, right, it goes down to an ebb and flow after, right? So there's still the need to release new music, but the, the economics are different. Now in the subscription era, these kids have figured out that all boats rise. And it's amazing because they know this, right? And the simple is this, they release their first album, they get some fans, right? And it ebbs along, but then all of a sudden they release the second album, okay? And they, now they're more popular and they've done the grind. So they sell a little bit more, drafting in those original fans, drafting in new fans, but all those new fans are going, wow, I love this band. Have they got any other albums? Well, they go back catalog, why? Because they have a subscription, cost nothing, don't have to, pony up 20 bucks you just go let's listen to them and if it's any good they'll start streaming it so the second album does a little better but the first album comes underneath then the third album so all boats rise in the streaming area the bigger you can make your catalog and the more often you can release music and build your customer base your old music doesn't die on the vine it actually goes with everything it's quite remarkable so um then this next one is called uh, repurpose reuse did i miss one here no, I didn't repurpose, reuse. So this is super, super important, okay? So during the course of the year, writing new music is tough, right? So it's extremely tough, right? Because a good song's hard to write. But what all these artists have realized is that you can write the song and then you can repurpose it or reuse it. I'm gonna use this artist as an example because it's prototypical, perfect, right? So Noga Erez released Kids, full studio version, phenomenal producer, her partner, Ori, right? Album is doing really well. But at the same time, they had this really cool thing where they would then take those produced kind of hip hop, rappy kind of, it's kind of, you have to listen to it, understand what it is. But then they would try to recreate it in one takes with just acoustic instruments, phenomenal musicianship, same album, same songs called Kids Against the Machine. Right? Then she released a single disc recently called Nails, and now she's getting a little bit notoriety over the last year with the success of this album. And then Missy Ellis said, I'd love to do a feat, so they went and did a feat. So again, once the EP is released, the analytics will inform where you should reperp where, where you should deploy some repurpose tactics. Do an acoustic version of your most popular track, know where the best live recording venues are during your tour, explore adding a feat or and recutting a popular track, release an extended or deluxe version. Basically, during the year you promote that new EP, repurpose the content. This is easier than writing new music. So it's one of the tactics I see every year and it happens with great regularity, repurpose and reuse. Okay, being prolific is the business. We're gonna talk more about this later. Reality check number five. If your catalog is old, it's a problem. But there's a solution, right? And it's remarkable how much I've seen this and probably the best example when Madonna released her new album in uh, new album in okay so hold on release new LP of new music so that's what one of the tactics release a new best of reissue all your old LPs on all DSPs and the great example I use is Madam X um, by Madonna was released in 2019 wasn't that great an album it's okay right wasn't anything like her famous albums and her monthly Spotify listeners the day before was 10 million monthly Spotify listeners. It's Madonna. She's pretty big. So she's got people listening, right? The day after her multi her monthly Spotify listeners jumped to 15 million. I cataloged this. I watched it. These people weren't listening to the new album. It was like, Oh, Madonna, 
Far out. I forgot all about her. I'm going back to I'm going back to Like a Virgin. I'm going back to Material Girl. And these people didn't go and brush off their CD and turn on their CD player. They all had Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon Music. They streamed it. Wow. Today, because of this releasing of now two albums, right? And sometimes it was a reissue, right? Today, she's at 20 million monthly Spotify listeners. And this is what I call the classic double dip. It's a little aside. But if you think about it, the record companies made money on the CDs. Wow, ah, galore. All of a sudden, older people are starting to get into Spotify. You remember this talk about catalog music. 18 months old. It's unbelievable. We'll, get, we'll do that some other time. And now these record companies are just banking money because they made a fortune already when they were selling the CDs. And now people that bought the CDs are just streaming it and pouring in the streaming revenue to the major labels. Unbelievable. Classic double dip. Okay. Re-engaging your old fans with new music will stimulate your back catalog. Okay. So if you have an old catalog, right? One of the best stories was I actually met Anne Murray at the airport. I actually went up to her because I looked on Spotify and I was like, oh my God, she's still got like a million monthly Spotify listeners. And I actually talked to her and I said, listen, Miss, Miss Margaret, right? If you release a new album, you'd probably double your revenue. She was like, how do you know? She says, I know. This is what happens. She would double her revenue. So again, old catalog, reissue. So many of these guys still have CDs and go, where's my revenue? When their music's only available on Spotify or CD Baby or, 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 or SoundCloud. When Just release it everywhere. Always. Okay. Reality check number six. You must engage your fans in real life. Gotta right? It is the highest form of engagement, right? It is the most sticky form, right? And you have to tour and engage your fans IRL. You also need to kill it, okay? Your fans, as we talked about, have thousands of choices, right? And these young kids that are going to be making up most of your super fans, right? This is the way it is, right? That's the available pool and that 15 to 25 categories, most of your super fans are going to be found, right? They have thousands of choices and they're discerning and they love it. If you're boring or mediocre live, they will move on. The more real players you have, the better. I've noticed this is a trend. Live performance has gotten better. It's improving, right? And if you're an electronic act, well, they're doing things to make it so visceral on stage. It's hard not to love it. You know, and I know, and I've seen guys play NPCs in real time, and it's freaking amazing. It's as good as them shredding on a guitar. But so you got to kill it live, right? And the goal is to leave that venue with new fans. That's the whole goal. Okay, kill it IRL on stage and you will grow your fan base. Reality check number seven, write cohesive EPs and LPs. Okay. The day of the 99 cent single is dead. The album era is back. There is zero financial consideration to buy that LP. If a fan liked your single, they will just stream your LP. If the LP EP is all over the map, you may get the dreaded skip. A cohesive LP with the singles place right equals top to bottom play. Top to bottom play equals more recurring revenue. Write a cohesive narrative for an entire LP EP. It will pay dividends. And I show you over here the single sales, right? The fact that they've gone to nothing. They used to be everything in 2012. It was the highest form of unit sales. Now it's a distant last place. Okay, be authentic and cohesive when you're writing your LPs. Reality check number eight, learn to mine your metrics. Okay, this is the other thing when people crap on Spotify, right? What we don't realize is that Spotify gives away everything. It's unbelievable, right? Spotify artist is amazing. And, and they're not the only one, but it's one I'm just going to talk about right now. If you're an artist on Spotify, however you get there from a label, an indie label, and or through an aggregator like DistroKid or CD Baby or TuneCore, right? They cough it up, man. They cough up a lot of stuff. You know exactly where, when, what track, how much, what time of the day. You know where your fans are. You know where you got to go. You know that you might have released an album. You thought the two singles would be the most popular, but who knew? Track four, which you thought was a sleeper, is one everybody loves. Tell you something, right? You never got this in the old days. So the actual analytics that Spotify gives you, if you mine them, can pay dividends. That's why all these artists know exactly how to do their tours because they know where their fans are and they know how many fans. So all this stuff, if you mine your metrics, it's pretty remarkable. Now you need, you need some followers, then it gets better, but the more followers you have, and eventually when you move to a, a facilitator label or a label and you're not hundred percent any, this is the type of things that they take over, leaving you more space to write because writing's the hardest thing. And these new younger labels, what I call facilitator labels, really understand this. And they simply go, you write music, we'll take care of all this stuff. Okay. Never before has so much data been available to artists. Unbelievable. 
Okay, reality check number nine. You don't need the mainstream anymore. Indie or small label at all costs. Okay, listen, let's, let's just get honest. The mainstream is still the best of the best, and they still run the show, right? The, the, the mainstream is where giants are, the best producers, some phenomenally talented artists, best mixers, engineers, budget, pull the levers, marketing, promotion, right? It's unbelievable how big and how much money the mainstream is making right now, and they're spending it, and they're spending it in really crafty ways. It's another time, okay? But if you make it there and you, you're listening to this thing and you already made it to the mainstream and you got one of the major three labels pushing you and helping you, congrats, man, that's fantastic. But as we've realized, that's a very small amount of the pie, right? Right. And if you think that's the barrier that you're not making, you're not a successful artist unless you're there, then you're missing out on what I've observed. So many thousands and thousands of artists making art money on their terms. So anyone can release music now. Small labels are now becoming facilitators. I talked about just recently, right, where they kind of go, we love your music. We just want to take away all that silly stuff that you've been dealing with. You need to write music because it's the biggest thing you need. Just keep writing. What should I write? Oh, no, no. You're the artist. You know what to write. You're authentic. That's why you have a fan base. So, and then lastly, but artist owned at all costs, right? And um, Taylor Swift is the best example of this because she's she got a great old school contract, but her masters were part of the record contract and part of her catalog. And then when her label got bought up and swallowed up by bigger ones, the ownership of those masters went with the catalog. So she had no control, right? So in the olden days, well, they're, they're, they're making all the CDs, right? But she knew, okay, guess what I'm going to do? I'm just going to re-release and I'm going to re-record all my albums and re-release them. And because she knew that now she owns those masters, she owns those, and that her millions of fans don't have to consider to drop another 20 bucks for that CD, they all have a streaming subscription. Hey, just listen to it. Brilliant. She's brilliant. Okay. Misconception number three, fix the royalty streaming payouts and it's done. Oh, I love this one. It's amazing. Royalty reform is needed, but you need to understand where they came from. This is important. And always ask the question, what is the fair per stream payout? I've asked this for so many people. That, oh, Spotify's a ripoff. And I go, okay, what's the right payout? 99% of the time, nobody has a clue. And it tells me right away that although their heart's in the right place, they don't really understand that it's a one-to-one -one radio royalty. It's like an old radio royalty. It's not a single unit sale making 30%, right? So I encourage everybody to develop some acumen to be united on what reform is needed. I really do encourage it. Read up on it. So here's my top suggestions from a reform standpoint. We got to get rid of free anything. Spotify free has got to go. As much as it's radio and it's kind of cool, I think it's time, right? It has value, but it dilutes the royalty pool way too much in my opinion. Understand it's a pro rata payment and this benefits the big labels. All the money that these DSPs get in royalties put into a big bucket and then they kind of look at, okay, the streaming percentage bucket and that creates a pie of percentages and those percentages get overlaid over the pro rata bucket. This benefits the big guy. The little guy kind of loses out on this. I'd love it if we could switch to a one-to-one -one payment system where if I if I like the Unknown Mortal Orchestra and I stream him 5,000 times, my 5,000 5, 5, streams go right to him. That would be fantastic. Okay, here's the most important one, not mine. This came from a, um, a document that the UN created, believe it or not. It's kind of cool. Uh, maybe I'll try to figure out where that one is, but it was a very long document. But their number one recommendation was this. When the whole thing was invented, they thought it was going to be interactive. Spotify was going to be 100% interactive. Apple Music customers were only going to lean in, right? Which means that radio and other terrestrial and also internet style of playing stuff, just lean back and the music gets played, would survive and be fine. And those royalties would, you know, go up to the PROs and all that stuff. But what happened is that it wasn't interactive. It's very, it's very, very passive. And what's happened is the big algorithms and the big playlists and all these DSPs have realized that's the money, it's all the passive stuff that they add into. So what they suggested is that there needs to be a new passive royalty that's extra and above to give to the artists. That if these big DSPs are gonna make a lot of hay and a lot of traction with their customers interacting with their passive elements, these digital service providers should have to pay an extra royalty for passive play. I'm all for this one. And then of course the entire system needs to be simplified. It's way too complex. Okay. Own your vision and your masters. Reality check number 10. Authenticity is your brand. Okay. I don't think I have anything about this. Um, so I'm going to go back. 
I, all I noticed is the most I dug off the mainstream is that I was like, oh my God, who is this? Who's doing this? It's like, that's brave. I never heard anybody do that. They can't have any fans. I think one of the first ones was Thundercat, right? Because I saw Thundercat and I was like, this guy's amazing. And my buddy said, I'm going to go see him on Montreal. He's so amazing. I said, well, nobody's going to be there. And so he went and he called me the next day and I said, so who was there to see Thundercat? I mean, all time signatures, funk, fusion, it's all over the place. It's really crazy music. Love it, right? But I said, was it 10 people? And he says, Clint, ceiling to rafters, wall to wall, 20 something, singing his crazy songs back to him. And I realized... That authenticity, for whatever reason, when you get into this sweet spot of 15 to 25, which is where most people, all your music lovers, beyond that, we have got music paralysis and some other things to talk about. But for whatever reason in this new generation, since they're not, they're not influenced by what the mainstream is telling them to listen to, they are all hunters and sharers. And when it's authentic, they love it. For whatever reason, the more authentic you are to your voice or finding your authentic voice, the more successful people tend to get. It's crazy. But authenticity is your brand. Never, never forget this. Don't try to make Max Martin pop. You got to find out who you are and make the music you are. That will resonate with your fans more. Okay, this is the best quote ever. It came from an album. This was in their Spotify about this opportunity to pitch and sell. And we're Lucy Daydream, a band from Denver, Colorado, and we do what we want. Perfect. Okay, this is, I love it. It's phenomenal. Okay, authenticity is your brand. It's a slogan that I use that I feel very strongly about. There you go. Okay, reality check number 11, being prolific is the business. Okay, you need to be obsessed with the do, not the done. I see this all the time. One of the marks when I find these successful making artist money bands, they all have something in common. This amazing, relentless work ethic to keep writing, to keep releasing content, to keep trying, to keep spinning, to create narratives, to keep expressing. And you can tell that every single one of them have an obsession with this. They have an obsession with the do. And then I see a lot of artists that are really talented, but they do one thing and then they get totally fixated on that one done thing. And they run around going, why aren't I famous from this one done thing? Right? And this means that they don't have a depth of catalog. They don't have a depth of material. It might've been the greatest song ever it got some play but in this era with so much music you'll come up on the Richter scale and you'll fall away only the people that are prolific and again there's some detractions from that and there's some pluses from that but being prolific is the business and you need to be obsessed with the do not the done do it and then they all know okay it's, it's done now I gotta go pay homage to that do a tour but I can't wait to get back to the do and write again and keep expressing this is a huge thing that I've noticed that is a common thread with all these successful artists off the mainstream especially making a living so being prolific is the business reality check number 12 so this is is there opportunity and wrapping it all up and look I'm gonna say it's not easy right this is a very difficult business um, but there's never been a more free time than right now. There's zero barrier for you to make music because the gear is really accessible and inexpensive, right? And there's no, there's no barrier to launch. You just got to keep doing it and find a fan base. So here we're going to go over them, okay? It's no longer about selling anything. It's about finding, growing, nurturing engagement with your fan base. There's just too much music. Millions of choices for music lovers. You need to be prolific and authentic, right, to be sticky. Rockstar money's rare. Art money is attainable. It's the sum of all engagement fundals that trigger your recurring revenue streams new music is king you need to be prolific with repurposed new tracks or new music to sustain engagement if your catalog is old releasing something new even if it's repurposed tracks will stimulate play of your back catalog check mark you must engage in real life it's the stickiest and value rich form of engagement and you must kill it or your fans will move on write cohesive lps and eps there is no considered purchase anymore you want your fans to hit play on track one and not stop till the end learn to understand your metrics they're free spotify and many other dsps have given you deep analytics learn to mine them and it will pay dividends you do not need the mainstream anymore i love the mainstream giants some of the best people in the industry but if you're just starting out into your small label at all costs, you want to own your masters. If you make the big label world, fantastic. I love you for it. Okay. Being prolific. Authenticity is your brand. Find your true voice. Be brave and authentic. Young 
and music fanatics resonate with authenticity. I've seen it over and over again. Being prolific is the business. Until your catalog is deep, write prolifically. This fuels the building of a fan base and hones your authenticity. Be obsessed with the do, not the done. There is artistic opportunity everywhere, and this fundamental work ethic will always guide you. I've noticed this. Creators will create, keep creating. I did these reality checks for people out there trying to figure out what to do. None of these things are earth shattering. They're just a really good list of things that I've observed are happening every day. And the people that are deploying all these tactics are seen to be making a living, even if it's just art money, but some of them are making a really handsome art living. Okay. Anyways, C-Dub, AKA Clint. Thanks so much and have a great day. Mm -hmm.